Welcome everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's session on pioneering our understanding of the human brain. I'd like to introduce Dr. Elizabeth Buffalo. She is professor of the Department of Physiology and Biophysics at the University of Washington, as well as chief of the Neuroscience Division of the Washington National Primate Research Center. She will be presenting in our Brain Initiative Scientific Updates track on how the human brain learns to learn. For a complete biography on our speaker, please visit the biography tab at the top of your screen. My name is Dr. Roshan Akashanian, and I will be your moderator for today's event. We are delighted to bring you this educational web seminar presented by LabRoots. We would also like to extend our special thanks to the program directors of the Brain Initiative, in particular, Dr. James Nat, for their efforts in organizing today's session. Before we begin, I would like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting questions during the presentation. Simply click on Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen and type your questions in the drop-down box. We will also be offering a unique opportunity to directly address awardees of the Research on Humans Division of the Brain Initiative. This live panel Q&A will take place today at 9 a.m. Pacific Time, 12 p.m. Eastern Time. Dr. Buffalo's presentation is educational and this offers free continuing education credits. Please click on the continuing education cre credits tab located at the top right corner of the presentation window and follow the process to obtain your credits. Now, without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Elizabeth Buffalo. So I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me to participate um, in this webinar and um, to describe some of the main goals of our U19 grant, um, which is supported under the BRAIN Initiative. Um, and I'll also be presenting some of the early preliminary work from, a, from our research. So the overall goal of this research program is to try to understand how the human brain learns to learn. The brain has a remarkable ability to store and retrieve information. So detailed memories can be formed after as little as one exposure, and those memories can be retained for decades. Importantly, recent studies have demonstrated the critical role of a mental schema or a learned cognitive structure in supporting rapid memory formation. So in this example, um, after having many experiences of going shopping in a grocery store, we formed a mental schema of the store that can help us quickly recognize the overall behavioral context of this market. Um, and it also helps us quickly identify items in the scene and in practice, our mental schema facilitates our ability to find items and to form new memories of the locations of particular aisles, even if we're shopping in a new store. In essence, this previously acquired knowledge provides a framework that shapes how ongoing experience is perceived and remembered. And this resonates with older ideas from neuropsychology of learning to learn as a mechanism by which rapid learning might be accomplished. So the idea behind learning to learn is that if you encounter multiple tasks that have uh, or that share some common aspect across tasks, then this enables learning of the structure, which is common to the learning set, which will then facilitate learning on new tasks. And commonalities across tasks may include commonalities in stimulus structure, um, including either the sensory modality that's involved or the particular attended features that are important for the task. A learning set can also involve commonalities in the structure of the decision or choice space that the subject might be making, um, commonalities in the temporal structure of the trial, including aspects like when to expect stimuli or delays and when the subject is able to make their choice. And there could be commonalities in the computational structure, including what kind of information is important to maintain in working memory um, and how to map that information onto choices. Importantly, we're interested in the nature of that mapping function, which could then be leveraged in order to make inferences about stimuli when they're observed for the first time. That is, in order to be able to have rapid new learning. So in this example, um, through the learning of individual problems, which are shown at the bottom, the subject can develop a learning set as shown at the top. Um, and this learning set represents the rule that on each problem, one stimulus will be re rewarded and one will not. And this process of learning to learn is thought to facilitate new learning by reducing the dimensionality of the space that the organism has to search um, in order to adapt to, new, to novel problems. So one exciting paper that was just published last month um, from Sylvia Worth's lab demonstrated the existence of schema cells in the hippocampus. So these are cells that showed a similar representation across mazes 
um, that the monkey navigated. And these mazes differed in their specific visual features, but they shared a common structure. And in the study, monkeys also showed rapid learning when they encountered a new maze, um, possibly because of the development of a schema for the mazes and the task structure. And the development of a schema that supports this kind of rapid learning is thought to involve not only this, but interactions between the hippocampus and the neocortex. However, the neural circuitry that underlies this kind of rapid one trial learning is not well understood. So in our U19 program, we're using innovative techniques for recording in monkeys, um, and we're also using single unit recordings in human epilepsy patients. And we're capitalizing on the unique opportunity to establish cross-species comparisons of hippocampal neocortical interactions. Um, the three primary goals of our research program are shown here, and they are to identify the neural mechanisms that support schema development and rapid learning in monkeys and humans, we aim to develop and validate novel techniques for large-scale recording from recordings from multiple distributed regions of the human and non-human primate brain. And we'll be doing this during learning and also through reversible inactivation in the non-human primate and during sleep um, in both monkeys and humans. And then finally, we aim to generate and test a multi-region computational understanding of circuit mechanisms um, that underlie schema development as well as rapid learning. So this slide shows the types of interactions and collaborations that exist across our U19 program. Um, experimental work shown in the middle of the slide will be carried out in monkeys in my lab, as well as in the lab of Dave Friedman. And uh, at the bottom is the work in human epilepsy patients. And this is carried out uh, with uh, Robert Knight, Jack Lynn, and Jeff Ogeman. And uh, these recordings in humans will be carried out using identical behavioral tasks as those used in the monkeys, as well as many overlapping brain regions. So one of the benefits of research in non-human primates is that monkeys can be trained to perform these complex tasks of learning and memory that are identical to tasks that we'll use with the human subjects. And I think this is a particular strength of our cross-species approach. Now, these experimental findings will be incorporated by um, Zhao Jing Wang, shown on the left, into computational models that will provide further theoretical insight and will motivate further experiments. And then on the right, um, our data science core, which is led by Adrian Fairhall and Ariel Rokum, will provide computational and theoretical insights into circuit dynamics and will aid all of the projects in the management and sharing of these really large da uh, neural data sets. So again, our central questions are, how is learning set represented in the primate brain? And how does an established learning set facilitate rapid new learning? So our standard setup uh, in the non-human primate is shown here. So in these experiments, we have the monkeys seated in a primate chair while we're recording neural activity. Um, and we have the monkeys viewing and interacting with stimuli presented in front of them on a computer monitor. In the case of the recordings with human epi epilepsy patients, um, we'll use laptop computers at the bedside uh, with patients who have electrodes implanted as part of seizure monitoring. And one task that we've been using uh, with both the non-human primates and the patients is shown here. This is the Wisconsin card sorting task. An example of the display of this task is shown on the top left. So on each trial, subjects are presented with four stimuli that are comprised of different features, which include um, color, shape, and texture. And the subject's task is to learn through trial and error which feature happens to be the target feature within a given block of trials. So the square um, on the right around the stimuli indicate the subject's choice on each trial. So this is showing a series of trials, sort of going from top to bottom and left to right. Um, and the green square represents the correct trial and the red square represents the incorrect trial. So what this is showing is that through trial and error, the subject was able to converge in the last three trials on an understanding that blue was the target feature and they didn't need to pay attention to shape or um, the uh, texture of the stimulus. In this task, after a subject reaches a criterion level of performance on a given rule, then the rule will be switched without any instruction to the subject. At that point, the subject will need to learn again a new rule um, through trial and error. 
So we found that monkeys and humans can perform this task. Uh, monkeys are able to learn new rules. Uh, within each session, they can learn about 30 to 40 new rules. Um, and they can do this with both intra and extra which would uh, indicate a switch within a given feature that is um, either color, shape, or texture, um, but switching between specific instances of that feature, while an extra-dimensional shift would include uh, switching across features. Uh, monkeys can perform this task, uh, taking about 30 trials to reach criterion for each switch. And human subjects also perform this task really well, um, taking about 10 to 15 trials to reach criterion. Now, analysis on this task can involve both measures of trials to criterion and how many switches the subjects were able to perform within a given recording session. But we can also look at the rate of learning, which is shown here. So the top graph here represents a rule that was learned in a stepwise manner with a very sharp transition between making incorrect responses, as shown on the bottom, and correct responses um, at the top of this figure while the lower graph shows the learning of a rule that happened more gradually. And we will be assessing neural activity with, that is associated with these distinct forms of learning. As I mentioned, we've developed novel techniques for large-scale recordings throughout uh, the monkey brain. So this is shown on the left. We can record throughout the medial temporal lobe as well as the prefrontal cortex. Um, and the slides on the left show our target regions um, on an MRI at the top of a monkey brain. Um, so we have one drive that uh, targets the hippocampus and the surrounding medial temporal lobe cortex. And then we also have an anterior drive that allows us to sample from multiple regions within the prefrontal cortex. Um, on the right, you can see typical coverage for a human patient. So we have recording sites throughout the prefrontal cortex, as well as um, recordings from deep in the medial temporal lobe in the hippocampus and the amygdala. And these uh, include electrodes that have microwires for single unit recording. Um, so what's exciting is in these experiments, we can record single unit activity as well as the local field potential from homologous brain regions um, in monkeys and humans while they're performing the, exactly the same task. So this slide just shows some of our preliminary data. This is the activity of a single unit recorded in from the anterior cingulate cortex of a human patient. Um, and this was an interesting neuron which showed a feedback sensitive neural response. So in this figure, uh, the green line at time zero represents the time of feedback to the patient on each trial. And this neuron showed an increased firing rate for incorrect trials shown in red compared to correct trials, which are shown in blue. Um, the figure on the right just shows the waveform uh, recorded from the single neuron. So our preliminary work has shown similar kind of responses in other areas of the prefrontal cortex, as well as in the hippocampus, in both monkeys and humans. And we're currently working on analyses to investigate how this kind of activity, as well as other task-related responses, might support the formation of new learning in this task. Another kind of behavioral task that we're going to be using is motivated by older work from Harlow from 1949, um, where he showed that over um, the learning of many different problems, um, there was the development of a learning set. So through experience with many different discrimination problems, the monkeys were able to get better and better um, in, the, in the sense of taking fewer trials to learn each new discrimination. And after experience with hundreds of these kinds of problems, um, as shown in the very top line, the monkeys were able to learn essentially within one trial uh, the new discrimination problem. In our version of this, uh, this is shown on this slide, the monkeys have been trained to associate a position, either making a left or rightward saccade, um, with particular stimuli that are presented at the center of the screen. And this is work from Dave Friedman's lab, where they've been able to show that monkeys are able to demonstrate this kind of faster and faster learning through successive discrimination problems. So what this is showing is that by the end, by um, after they've learned about four or five of these pairs, the monkeys were able to take just a very few number of trials in order to reach criterion on this task. And so the question is what kind of neural activity might support formation of this kind of schema? And um, we, want to, we want to understand this by using this kind of task, as well as other tasks that require the monkeys to make associations between uh, stimuli and colors, 
and then also see if they can then, as shown in the bottom, make the inference uh, between this kind of categories um, that have been associated, and then whether they can show rapid new learning if we try to teach them about new stimuli um, and, and as rapidly assimilate them into these different categories. Now, in terms of how the hippocampus and the prefrontal cortex might work together in support of memory formation and schema development, one hypothesis is that this interaction may be coordinated through fast oscillations. About uh, These are sharp wave ripples that are at about 120 hertz. Um, and these sharp wave ripples have been implicated in previous studies in learning and memory across species. So we've been able to identify sharp wave ripples, as shown here, in both monkeys and humans during periods of sleep. So on the left, you can see examples of these hippocampal sharp wave ripples um, recorded from a monkey during a rest period following task performance. And then on the right, you can see an example of a sharp wave ripple recorded from a human epilepsy patient. This was also recorded during sleep. Some new work uh, coming out of Bob Knight's lab uh, and work with Jack Lynn has shown um, that that uh, this prefrontal hippocampal interaction during sleep is important for memory consolidation. So what uh, I'm showing here on the left represents in red a spindle. This is a spindle that was recorded in the prefrontal cortex and showing that it occurs or it's preferentially nested on the peak of a slow oscillation recorded through EEG. Um, the slow oscillation represents the upstate. And what they uh, demonstrated was that this coupling phase, the precise uh, phase synchrony of the spindle with the slow oscillation, predicts overnight memory consolidation. Um, and then on the right, this is showing that uh, optimal coupling actually induces a multiplexed bidirectional hippocampal uh, prefrontal cortex connectivity. So the blue line represents the optimal coupling between the spindle um, and the slow oscillation. And these data suggest that when this optimal coupling um, is uh, associated with theta frequency, this is related to um, stronger connectivity from going from the hippocampus to the prefrontal cortex. And during the spindle frequency, it's uh, associated with stronger connectivity from the prefrontal cortex to the hippocampus. And so we're going to um, be, be investigating these kinds of signals um, across our uh, behavioral tasks that I just described, and then also in monkeys to see if we can uh, identify the same kinds of signals in the non-human primate, um, where we'll have a better ability to localize the, uh, the units to particular regions throughout the hippocampus and also within the prefrontal cortex. And then all of this work uh, feeds into um, uh, some of the work in Zhaojing Wang's lab, which will help in providing theoretical insights into the circuit mechanisms that support this work. Um, and some of the goals in, involve uh, training recurrent neural network models that are capable of learning to learn, that can qualitatively replicate our experimentally observed learning set performance curves. And then they'll be analyzing these recurrent neural network population and also the single unit activity, which will allow them to generate hypotheses and experimentally testable predictions um, that then we'll be able to test in our recordings, again, in, in monkeys and humans. Um, and then we'll also be, uh, as I mentioned, analyzing the model and generating hypotheses and experimentally testable predictions. Um, and recently, advances in the modeling of these recurrent neural networks provide a very promising framework within which to interpret the kinds of complex data that we'll be gathering. And by training artificial networks to perform the same tasks as our experimental subjects, these learned dynamics can serve as a plausible network implementation of the cognitive computation. Um, so we can then examine these networks to discover hidden dynamical structure of these computations, and we can also develop hypotheses for how the biological network may implement them. And finally, all of this work is critically dependent on a strong data science core. And so one of the exciting aspects of the synergistic approach of these experiments is that we have a similar kinds of experiments running across species and across laboratories. So we need ways of establishing data standards, um, as well as ways to uh, facilitate data sharing. Um, we're working on, uh, this is work with Ariel uh, Rokum and Adrian Fairhall, they're working on uh, development of computational tools that will allow us to have collaborative development of these tools across laboratories. 
Um, we're going to have shared common computational environments and also scalable computing. Um, so as you can imagine, the data sets that we'll be um, collecting from these experiments are extremely large. And so we'll have to be able to manage them um, at this uh, and, and to be able to scale all the um, solutions that we that we're implementing. And then on the right, you can see um, what we're going to end up with, again, is obviously publishing the work uh, that uh, the data that, that results from these experiments, um, but also sharing the data and sharing the, the code that was used to, uh, to analyze the data. Um, again, hoping for greater uh, transparency and also replicability um, and maybe generating uh, data sets that could be used to inspire future experiments. So the overall goal, again, of our U19 program is to develop a comprehensive theory of the circuit mechanisms that underlie the human brain's ability to establish neural frameworks that enable rapid new learning. Um, so the overall goal of this U19 program is to develop a comprehensive theory of the circuit mechanisms that underlie the human brain's ability to establish neural frameworks um, that enable rapid new learning. And I just want to acknowledge uh, both our funding sources um, through the National Institutes of Neurological Disorders and Stroke, as well as the Brain Initiative. Um, and I'd like to acknowledge the members of the team who are contributing to the work. So the experimentalists shown in the middle um, include my lab, as well as the lab of Dave Friedman. And then at the bottom, uh, the work is with uh, from the human patients is with Jack Lynn, uh, Bob Knight, and Jeff Ogeman. And then on the left, um, Zhao Jing Wang, who's uh, leading up our modeling efforts. And then on the right, Adrian Fairhall and Ariel Rokum, who are uh, leading up the data science core. Um, and so uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Buffalo, for that very informative presentation. As a reminder, our speaker will be able to follow up any specific questions in the live Q&A at the end of this track. Coming up next, Dr. Yuli Rutishauser will continue the scientific updates of the Brain Initiative with a presentation on deciphering the neuronal mechanisms of human episodic memory at the single neuron level. And don't forget to join us at 9 a.m. Pacific time, 12 p.m. Eastern time, where we will be offering a unique opportunity to directly address awardees of the research on human division of the Brain Initiative. We look forward to seeing you there.